is there evidence of past life on Mars and so on. So I'm going to talk about MSL, which is the mission uh, to be landed on the surface after Phoenix. But I, I'm going to get there a little bit uh, indirectly, uh, wander around and uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we now think of the, the history of, of Earth and Mars, uh, talk about how we really get at this life question with looking for, for various biomarkers, whether they're in the atmosphere or in the surface, um, and then uh, kind of the uh, parameter space of missions before uh, MSL and after MSL that will help us uh, get answers, hopefully, to some of these questions. And then a little bit more specifically about MSL, which we uh, hope to launch in a couple years and uh, is the next really big, big rover on Mars. I, MSL just got named Curiosity, and I got to get in the habit of uh, not calling it MSL, which is kind of a duddy NASA acronym, Mars Science Lab, but, but Curiosity, which uh, a student won in, in a contest. Of course, telescopes are great things. Uh, before telescopes, uh, Mars in mythology was, you know, of course, the, the Roman god of war and temples were built in, in Athens. You can go look uh, in, in honor of Mars. But then telescopes came along and, uh, of course, we started figuring out that the planets uh, orbited around the sun and uh, uh, Galileo, uh, of course, uh, made these wonderful telescopes. And once people started looking at Mars, they discovered things like the poles of Mars, uh, Cassani, and uh, uh, Schiaparelli discovered, saw some features on Mars, and uh, because of the quality of the telescope's imaginations went a little bit wild, and he believed, he called these canali, these features, and actually, in fact, uh, made up maps of them. And so early on with this idea of canali and uh, possible water, um, of course, uh, the idea that there might be other uh, life on Mars and what it might look like, folks had to use their imaginations. Percival Lowell was somebody who uh, pursued this. Uh, a good astronomer, uh, a good astronomer of his career, uh, tried to tried to map this out. And of course, there was this uh, 1938 uh, radio drama where the invasions of the Martians was happening, and uh, it scared the Dickens out of all sorts of people. You know, eyes black and gleam like a serpent, and uh, so of course Hollywood uh, picked up on this, and uh, you know just since 1964, just look at a, a few of the movies that uh, involved Mars, classic like classics like Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, and uh, Mars Mars Needs Women, and of course the one I I, I really like, Total Recall, by uh, starring Arnold, who's now uh, running California, and so on. But of course, these all featured kind of uh, little green men who were not necessarily necessarily friendly to us. And of course, now you know the idea is we're not necessarily looking for bipeds or things with with four legs or six legs, but really uh, we want to understand did did primitive life, microbial life, ever develop on Mars? That certainly has been a driver for part of the program. But as you folks all clearly understand, getting to Mars is just extremely difficult. It's kind of interesting to go back and look at the history of, of human beings trying to get to Mars with robotic uh, spacecraft. The Russians really put a huge effort into this. And of course, the space age was just coming. A lot of failures, but of course, understanding how to do rocketry and get things into space was also kind of in its infancy. So I kind of color-coded here the, the failures, either launch fail failures or cruise failures. And there's a lot of red. Uh, there's a couple of yellows in here, just a couple, a bit of data came back from, or, from uh, launches in 1971. Um, U.S. started a little bit later than that. First there was a failure, then 64 and 71. Uh, some partial successes. Uh, Mariner 9 actually got uh, to map the planet a bit, and darn, you know, there were no Canelli, but, you know, it looked pretty dry, no liquid water, but volcanoes and valleys and, and lots of other good stuff there. Uh, 1973 campaign, again, again mixed. Uh, Mars 5 orbiter uh, lasted a bit. Uh, Mars 7 lander uh, got some descent data, but didn't get any from the surface. Um, so if you kind of look at pre-Viking, uh, if, if you're keeping score and figured that Mars was out to get spacecraft, the the, the home team there had 14, and the, and the, uh, <laughs> the visitors kind of had two. It's really uh, kind of an amazing statistic. 
But then 75 came along and uh, the Viking landers, and just uh, you know, amazing how rapidly our understanding of how to get to space and land on another planet had progressed. Just an amazing vehicle, two, two Viking landers landed uh, successfully on the surface. Uh, Jerry Sof Sofen is shown here, the, the project scientist. And there's a picture from Mars kind of showing this rocky, deserty place and uh, uh, imprint from the, from the arm, similar to what uh, Brett des described for, for Phoenix. And by that time, the missions really were looking for life. They were uh, looking for microbial life and had set up some experiments to, to do that specifically. And I'll just talk a little bit about one, this gas exchange uh, experiment that was uh, referred to. Uh, Gil Levine was the uh, principal investigator on that where they put some water and a nutrient, uh, mixed it with soil, and then looked for a response to see if microbes would be metabolizing the soil, and kind of got what looked like a positive result. And, however, there was a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer on board, and the thought was, well, if you really had microbes and organics, you, when you heated things up, just like Tiga did on, on Phoenix, you should be seeing organics. And they really didn't see any. The instrument was working well. They saw backgrounds from the instrument, uh, but no organics. And so that kind of um, uh, put the exploration for life into a bit of a doldrum for, for quite a while, quite a, quite a few years, uh, although the exploration of Mars continued. The Soviets were successful with, with Phobos. Uh, Mars Pathfinder was kind of one of the first of these NASA smaller, faster, cheaper rovers, and you know, the little uh, yellow guy smiling there, it, it worked and, and got some data back, some elemental composition of the rocks. And then a bummer, there were a couple of, of failures that, that Brent talked about as well with the uh, polar lander and the Mars Climate Orbiter. Uh, but Mars Surveyor got there, and this set of data is really uh, what I think has, has really turned our understanding of Mars around. It's, it's from an instrument called MOLA that basically sends a laser beam down to the surface, measures the time it takes to get back to the spacecraft, and so it maps out the surface topography of Mars. And it's just amazing what level of geology you can do with this type of data and also combined with, with high resolution imaging from, from Mars. And so we've really transformed our, our, understanding, of, our understanding of the recent set of spacecraft results. Uh, Jap Japan got into the game a bit and uh, had a failure uh, with their first Mars mission. Uh, ESA sent up a mission which was really successful, Mars Express. It had this really wonderful uh, stereo imager on it, and uh, here, here's one of the, the really uh, interesting image of these uh, kind of uh, pillow basalts. And uh, what really also has transformed Mars, it started with Mars Express, the European spacecraft, was doing spectroscopy from Mars orbit. If you take an infrared spectra, of a rock, for example, you get a, a certain pattern coming back, and uh, you know nobody really knew whether Mars would be so totally covered by the dust storms and everything that you really could see differences. But in fact, it turns out you can see differences, and you can really identify, if not really specific minerals, at least classes of minerals from, from Mars orbit. And so that started with the ESA missions, and then uh, in particular, a mission that's now working very well, a NASA mission, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, is continuing to do that, getting both very, very high uh, spatial images. You, could, you saw those images of stuff on the surface of the uh, Phoenix Lander, for example, and also this really beautiful spectroscopy. And so our understanding of Mars from, from orbit is just tremendously improved. Uh, Brett talked about this mapping of the, of the hydrogen uh, another fundamental result. Uh, and then, of course, came the, came the MER rovers, which were just an incredible success, landed with their uh, balloon airbags deploying and bouncing around the surface, rolling to a stop. And uh, they got named Spirit and Opportunity. And the kind of idea of that mission was to understand if there was chemical evidence on the surface uh, for transformation by liquid water or if that was kind of all gone uh, with the geological processing that had happened on Mars. And sure enough, they saw minerals. Jerosite here is shown from one of the experiments, the Mossbauer experiment, that showed that uh, indeed surface water had been at the location of the uh, rover <coughs> uh, uh, opportunity. Spirit kind of landed on the other side of the planet. Uh, you can see if you're 
close enough to the front to uh, this uh, image of this dust devil going across the surface of Mars. And they kind of landed 